Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ido Berger, faculty co-director of the science program at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute and professor of astronomy in the Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences. I'm thrilled to welcome you today to our annual Next in Science Symposium, this year focused on the interrelated topics of food sustainability and climate change. This is a hybrid program, so it is great to see so many people here in the audience and to welcome the over 700 people joining us virtually from all over the world. We are here today to address and learn about the critical interplay between climate change and food. As noted clearly and succinctly in the IPCC sixth assessment report, climate change has reduced food security and affected water security, hindering efforts to meet sustainable development goals. The report goes on to talk about how these adverse effects lead to reduced health outcome, outcomes and increased mortality. Today's program will address critical aspects of the interplay between climate change and food. What does climate change mean for our existing food production and supply systems? How do our production and consumption habits contribute to the climate crisis? How can we adapt our food systems to ensure a more climate-friendly and sustainable future? The four speakers in this year's program will explore this complex interplay of food and climate change, challenging and illuminating our relationship with meat and water, soil and sea. The presentations will explore both regional and international perspectives, from the depletion of fish, fish stocks in the United States to crop failures in rural communities in the global south, while highlighting critical mitigation and adaptation strategies in these areas. I am particularly excited about today's um, event because the Next in Science series provides an opportunity for early career scientists whose creative cross-disciplinary and cutting edge research is thematically linked to introduce their work to non-specialists, fellow scientists, and one another. And as you will see, our four speakers today bring a lot of energy and creative thinking to this crucial topic. This event is also an important part of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute's new climate change initiative, an effort to explore the impacts of the climate crisis through an interdisciplinary lens and to address issues of climate justice, particularly the disproportionate effects on marginalized uh, communities locally and globally. Over the course of this initiative, the Institute will gather scholars, practitioners, and students to engage with issues that can be best understood and addressed by drawing on research from across multiple disciplines. For full description of our commitment and of our past and future programs, please visit our website, radcliffe.harvard.edu. Additionally, today's program is one of the kickoff events of Harvard Climate Action Week, which gathers climate leaders and experts in pursuit of durable, effective, and equitable solutions to the climate change the climate cha challenge uh, confronting humanity. Climate Action Week is organized and coordinated by the Salada Institute for Climate and Sustainability, and we thank them for their leadership and partnership on this critical topic. Before I introduce today's four speakers, I would like to give you a quick orientation uh, of the program. The program will have two sessions with two speakers each, separated by a short 10-minute break. After the individual presentations, we will have a group discussion and audience Q&A, which uh, will conclude at 4.30 p.m. For those of you in the audience, I encourage you to join us in person for a student poster session, showcasing work related to the broad themes of climate change and, sustain and environmental justice right after the symposium. This session will take place uh, here at the Knafel Center in Coolidge Room 105. Audience members, whether in person here in the room or online, are welcomed and encouraged to submit questions at any time using the Slido link provided on the screen behind me uh, and posted in the chat uh, um, box of the Zoom webinar. Before I introduce our first two speakers, let me take a moment to gratefully acknowledge the Melanie Mason Nemec 71 Current Use Fund for Science, which is supporting this event. I also want to acknowledge the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and our annual donors. Your generosity keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public, and we thank you. I'm also grateful to my fellow science co-director, Professor Immaculata DeVivo, who will lead the group conversation and audience Q&A later this afternoon. 
as well as to the Radcliffe Institute staff uh, for all of their hard work, especially the academic ventures and engagement team led by Becky Wasserman and the events team led by Jessica Vickland. And now to our speakers. Our first speaker of this session is Dr. Angela Rigdon, Assistant Professor in the Department of Earth System Science at the University of California, Irvine. Dr. Rigdon will tell us about climate change, the water cycle, and food production, a case study in southern Madagascar. Our second speaker of this session is Dr. Kimberly Aremis, Assistant Professor in the School of Marine Science and Policy at the College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment at the University of Delaware. Dr. Aramis will tell us about new challenges for the wor world's fisheries. Dr. Rigdon, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction and thanks everyone who, who are joining in person and joining remotely online. It's really exciting to have the opportunity to speak to you and share some of my work. So today I'll be talking about climate change, the water cycle, and food production, and I'll be sharing a case study that I've been working on in southern Madagascar. Okay, so in 2050, the Earth will be warmer than it is today, and that's shown here on this map. Here I've plotted temperature changes from pre-industrial conditions to 2050. The color on the map indicates whether it'll be warmer or cooler than pre-industrial conditions. The blue means that it'll be cooler, and the red means that climate models project that temperatures will be warmer. And what you can see is across the globe, every single grid box is red, indicating that the world is expected to warm across the entire globe. I've also plotted on this map diagonal lines. And these diagonal lines, which you can see right below Greenland, show regions in which climate models disagree on the sign of the trend. This map averages 34 different state-of-the-art climate models together, and there's only one small region in the world where there's disagreement. We can contrast this map with precipitation. And so now I'm showing average precipitation changes from pre-industrial conditions. Here, if we're expecting less precipitation, that's shown in brown. And if we're expecting more precipitation, that's shown in teal. What you can see is right off the bat, it's different than temperature. There are gonna be some regions of the world where climate models project decreases in precipitation, and there are some regions of the world where climate models project increases in precipitation, and the change is gonna be regional. What we can also notice is that much of the world is covered in these diagonal lines. And what that means is that the climate models, here there's 32 different climate models, are actually disagreeing on the sign of the trend. So some models are predicting increases while some are predicting decreases. And if you look at where a lot of the food is produced in the world, you'll see that there's a lot of uncertainty over land in these regions. And so there's just general uncertainty in how annual average precipitation will change moving forward. What's even more surprising to me is that there are actually some regions of the world where we don't know how much it has rained in the past, so just using observations. Here I've plotted mean daily precipitation in millimeters per day over Africa. This estimate of precipitation is actually 20 different observational products, and they're based on things like remote sensing, based on weather stations, based on models, and these are 20 kind of state-of-the-art precipitation observational data sets. And you should already be kind of thinking there's a red flag because there are 20 different products that represent the exact same thing. So let's look at how those 20 models differ from each other. So now each sub-map of Africa shows the difference between that product and the mean of the products. And what you can see is that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of variation in what we call observations. So let's look just at the Sahel. You can see it's about seven millimeters per day on average. And some, some of these observational data products are plus or minus three millimeters per day. So we have a wide range in how much it's been raining on estimate from 1983 to 2010 based on observations alone. And when we're thinking about how to adapt our food systems to changes 
in the water cycle, this is pretty concerning. If you have a garden in Boston, you know that plants need water. If it hasn't rained for a week, you need to go out and water your plants. That water goes into the soil, it goes into the roots of the plants, it goes up the xylem, it eventually makes its way to little pores on the leaves called stomata, where it evaporates into the atmosphere. As it evaporates, carbon dioxide goes into the leaf. This is the plant is, is, is photosynthesizing, it needs water. Water is really important for structural integrity of plants. So water is very critical to our agricultural systems. And if we have to, we're faced with this just big, big question, and the question that's on my mind a lot is given that the past and future changes in precipitation are relatively uncertain, how do we adapt our food systems to changes in the water cycle? And to answer this question, I'm gonna go through a case study in Madagascar, in southern Madagascar, and kind of going through this case study myself really taught me and shaped my perspective on how we should address um, and adapt our food systems to changes in the water cycle. So southern Madagascar is a semi-arid region and precipitation is strongly seasonal. Here I've plotted the climatological precipitation. On the x-axis is the month and on the y-axis is precipitation in millimeters. And you can see that it's receiving much of its precipitation in about three or four months, so December, January, February. And then there's a long dry season where it rains very infrequently. And you can imagine the, the, the planting and the food systems really revolve around the rains. The staple crops like maize, sorghum, potatoes, rice are planted on the, as the rain comes in during the onset. And then these crops are harvested at the end of the rainy season during the secession. And so when there's anomalously dry conditions, this can cause really devastating food shortages. So I told you, think about your garden. Water's really important for crops. Here's a visualization, actually, of quantitatively how production depends on water availability in a region of Madagascar. Here I've plotted year on the x-axis and rice production on the y-axis. Rice is a really important crop for Malagasy people. It comprises about 50% of their caloric intake, and it's really of high social and cultural importance. The solid line represents rice production that's reported by the Ministry of Agriculture, and the dashed line represents an estimate of rice production just based solely on how much water is in the soil. And what you can see is that if you just use water in the soil as a predictor of interannual variations in rice production, you do a pretty good job. Rice is really, really um, dependent on how much water is in the soil. So there was a recent drought in Madagascar. It lasted for four years, and these really dry conditions led to devastating food shortages. Here's a map from FuseNet. This is a map of food security outcomes, and it's the most recent map that they've produced, and what you can see is that the drought, the effects of the drought are still present. Much of the south is in a crisis kind of classification, and the black stippling represents that without food aid, it would be, the food security outcome would be much more severe. So one thing that I think about is, well, there's a drought, it's causing a famine, or I shouldn't say it's causing a famine, I should say some people think it's causing the famine, but is that right? And there's been this conflicting narrative on the role of climate change and the role of interannual variability and natural variability on the hydrologic cycle in southern Madagascar. So in June of 2021, the UN World's Food Program came out and they stated that the severe drought in Madagascar had spurred the world's first climate change driven famine. And then the New York Times I'm sorry, then there was a research group, the World Weather Attribution, and they came out and they said that they did a study and that the occurrence of poor rains as observed from July 2019 to July 2021 in southern Madagascar had not significantly increased due to human-caused climate change. The New York Times stated they summarized it by saying, low rainfall has caused a humanitarian crisis in Madagascar, but common assumptions about drought didn't hold up to scrutiny. 
And so I wanted to take an approach at this. I had been working in Madagascar. I had a lot of data on food production in Madagascar. And so I'm going to take a new look at it. And I'm going to follow a similar approach as the world weather attribution by looking at historical trends in water availability in Madagascar. I'm going to look at climate model simulations and how water availability has changed. And then I'm going to look at, ask this question, is climate change playing a role in the drought that we're seeing in southern Madagascar? But I'm going to do it using a new set of data. Rather than relying on precipitation data, which is really sparse in the region, there are no kind of long-term weather stations, I'm going to use remotely sensed data. And I'm going to use remotely sensed data from, that measure the land surface. And the two variables that I'm most interested in, the first is soil moisture. And the soil moisture is measured from microwave satellites. And it really represents the amount of water that's in the soil matrix. And the second is greenness, vegetation greenness. And this is an optical measurement. And it's as simple as it sounds. It's how green the vegetation is. And greener vegetation tends to correlate with more productive vegetation, more healthy vegetation. And now I'm going to switch to a movie. Let's see if I can do this. Cool. All right, so here's a movie showing monthly soil moisture and monthly vegetation greenness across Madagascar. Here we have soil moisture, and here we have vegetation greenness. And what you can see is they're very tightly coupled. When it gets dry, the vegetation becomes less green. Across this whole eastern coast of Madagascar, there's a really tall mountain range. We have moisture coming in from the Indian Ocean. It hits this mountain range and rains. And so it's really wet along this region, and subsequently, it's really green. And so vegetation greenness and soil moisture are very coupled. So rather than using precipitation, which we don't have good measurements of, we can use soil moisture and greenness to get a look at the hydrologic cycle. What's really cool about these measurements is that we have really long time series. And so vegetation greenness, for example, has been measured optically from satellites since the 1980s, since the early 1980s. So we have about four decades of vegetation greenness measurements. Likewise, we have about 20 years of soil moisture measurements. So we can build a model to look at water availability by just using these two pretty, pretty consistently measured indices. Here I've plotted year on the x-axis. There's vegetation greenness on this y-axis and soil moisture on this axis. Each one of these little up and downs is one seasonal cycle. You can see that it has a really strong seasonal variability because of the wet and dry season. And they're very tightly coupled. And so now we can look at how things have changed for four decades in a region without having to rely on uncertain precipitation estimates. And when we do that, here's what we find. Here I have month on the x-axis and the trend in soil moisture on the y-axis. For each month, I've calculated how soil moisture changes, and that's shown here in these um, red bars. And what you can see is for much of the year, there's very little change in soil moisture. But then, later in the year, as the, rains come, as the rains come, we see this decline in soil moisture. And that can be thought of as almost a delay in the onset of the rainy season. The rainy season is coming later. But this by itself, even with 40 years of observations, still doesn't tell us if climate change is playing a role in the drought or is driving these trends in the delay of the rainy season. So to answer that question, I turned to climate model simulations. And I first looked at simulations that had no emissions. So imagine taking a climate model, running the climate model, but not adding any anthropogenic emissions. These are often called pre-industrial control runs. And here's what the control runs look like. They basically hover around zero for every month of the year. So that says there's something happening in our Earth system currently that's not captured in these pre-industrial control runs. So let's take a look at what happens when we look at climate models that actually have forced anthropogenic emissions. And what you can see, they're plotted here in blue, is that for much of the year, they still hover around zero, these blue climate model simulations. But then when we get to the onset of the rainy season, we see that they're much more consistent with what we're seeing in observations. They're not perfect. 
The climate models don't capture exactly these 40-year trends, but there is this delay in the onset of the rainy season. And if we looked at annual averages in precipitation from climate models in Madagascar, we wouldn't see this at all. We would just see that climate models are uncertain in this region. It's really taking this deep dive into the monthly seasonal patterns that we capture this nice seasonal climate change fingerprint. And so it's, it's not enough for me. It wasn't enough to say that, OK, the climate models are consistent with the observations. We really wanted to dig in and figure out why. And so this plot is confusing. It's a lot. But I'm going to talk you through it. And I think everyone, by the end, will understand it. Here we have each subpanel. And each subpanel is a month of the year. And then on the x-axis is the year in the climate model simulation. It starts at 2015, and the climate models run to 2099. And so this is the time. And then on the y-axis is the latitude. And the latitude goes from negative 40 degrees to positive 40 degrees. And I've noted here where you can find Madagascar in this latitudinal range. So if you follow that dotted line, you'll see that that's where Madagascar is positioned across all months of the year, because its position isn't changing. The color indicates the vertical velocity of the atmosphere. You can think about this as basically how, how much the, the air is moving up or moving down. And the blue line represents basically the ITCZ, or the tropical rain belt. So this is a lot of rain is happening around the blue band. You can see in this red band, which is positioned over southern Madagascar, there's not a lot of rain happening, and that's because the atmosphere is moving downward. It's not ascending up to produce precipitation. And if we look at the position of the, the air that's moving downward, sometimes this is called the descending branch of the Hadley cell if you're interested in climate science, what we can see is the position of this, of this downward movement of air is moving southward. And it, this southward motion happens to be right over southern Madagascar. And so what's happening likely is that this descending air is, 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 is moving southward through time. It moves more south. And it's actually causing storm tracks to be deflected southward. And that's our running hypothesis now. And it would explain why we see a delay in the onset of the rainy season. And so just to summarize, I asked this big question. I said, given that past and future changes in precipitation are uncertain, how should we adapt food systems to climate change? Well, in the case of southern Madagascar, what we see is that there's going to be a shortening of the rainy season. And so when we think about adaptation strategies, they need to be focused on water management and timing. Timing is just so important. But more generally, generally, I think that these regional studies are really necessary in order to increase our understanding of what's happening. While looking at a global map is often beautiful, it's hard to capture these really small-scale climate processes that are happening at the regional scale. Also, I want to end by saying that there's now four decades of climate of, of um, remote sense, remotely sensed data from satellites, and I think this can really be leveraged in places with poor in situ records to understand um, our changing climate. And I thank you all for listening, and I am excited to answer questions during the Q&A. So thank you. Thank you.